Coming up today, ending months of arduous negotiations, a deal is struck on reforming Korea's labour market. The issue is expected to come up when Korea's finance minister faces lawmakers today at the ongoing annual parliamentary audit. In a major U-turn, Germany reintroduces border controls along its Austrian border in an attempt to reduce the number of refugees arriving in the country. Plus, 18-year-old Lydia Ko shoots a final round 63 to win the Evian Championship and become the youngest major champion in history. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello and welcome. It's 6am on Monday, September 14th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to our early morning edition of Arirang News. And we start with news that a tentative deal on overhauling Korea's rigid labour market has been struck. Representatives from labour, management and government hammered out a compromise at a meeting on Sunday, ending months of tense negotiations. The three sides agreed in principle that companies should be allowed to dismiss poorly performing workers, but agreed the criteria and procedures must be worked out before any workers are laid off. Currently, only companies in serious financial difficulty are able to dismiss underperforming workers. The three sides also agreed to ease labour restrictions that require companies to gain an employee's consent before changing the terms of their employment. The agreement requires approval from the Federation of Korea Trade Union Central Executive Committee by Monday to take full effect. More heated battles are expected between rival party lawmakers as the ongoing parliamentary audit enters its second week. The National Assembly's Strategy and Finance Committee is expected to grill Finance Minister Che kyung hwan over the government's plan to unilaterally pursue labour reform efforts if the tripartite meeting had failed to reach a compromise. Also, the Security and Public Administration Committee plans to quiz officials from the National Police Agency. The committee will focus its questions on the use of police expensive expenses for special activities as well as firearm accidents and countermeasures to crack down on crimes involving hidden cameras. Korea is seeking world heritage status for materials related to Japan's forced labour of Koreans during the colonial era. The move is being seen as a way to counter Tokyo's successful bid to list several controversial wartime industrial facilities as UNESCO sites back in July. Connie Kim reports. Korea is pushing to make the truth of Japan's forced labour of Koreans during its colonial rule known to the world. Diplomatic sources said Sunday, the government has submitted to the Cultural Heritage Administration more than 330,000 pieces of material, including documents and photos on Japan's forced labor of Koreans from 1910 to 1945. The material is also reported to include general information on Japan's occupation of territory outside of Korea and Japan. The collection of material is a result of more than a decade of work by the Cultural Heritage Administration. By next month, the administration will choose two items that it'll apply to list on UNESCO's Memory of the World Register. It'll then submit its application to a UNESCO committee, which will make its recommendations for endorsements next summer. The move is being seen as a way to counter Tokyo's successful bid in July to gain world heritage status for 23 industrial facilities where Koreans were forced into labor before and during World War II. If Korea's bid is successful, it'll be the third time archival material related to its modern history will be made part of the UNESCO list. Materials related to the May 18th democratic uprising against Korea's military rule in 1980 were added to the list in 2011, and those related to the Semar Undong, or New Community Movement, launched in 1970, were listed in 2013. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Now, staying on a related topic, the remains of scores of Koreans forced to labour at sites in Japan in the early to mid-20th century are being returned 
to their homeland this week. The committee in charge of repatriating the remains received the first remains over the weekend and will bring back the remains of all 115 people by this Friday. The remains will travel from their current location in Hokkaido to Korea's southeastern port city of Busan. The same route the, travel, the Koreans travelled when they were drafted into forced labour. A ceremony will be held at Seoul Plaza on Saturday and they will be laid to rest at a cemetery in Gyeonggi-do province the following day. Germany is implementing temporary border checks as the country has been overwhelmed by the influx of refugees arriving from its southern and eastern neighbours. The country's interior minister made the announcement on Sunday, stressing that it would be a temporary measure that would first begin on Germany's southern border with Austria. Citing security reasons, the minister noted that the main purpose of the measure was to restrict the current inflow of refugees into Germany and to return again to orderly migration procedures on the border. In a parallel move, Germany's national railway has temporarily suspended train traffic to and from Austria starting from Sunday afternoon local time. This as at least 50,000 asylum seekers have entered the country in the last week alone. 18-year-old golfer Lydia Ko has won the Evian Championship to become the youngest major champion ever. An amazing final round of 63 on Sunday saw the Korean-born New Zealander finish on 16 under, six shots clear of American Lexi Thompson. Ko becomes the youngest player of either gender in the modern era to become a major champion. Now, her victory also means Korea's Park Im Bee, the world number one, will have to wait at least another year to complete her super career Grand Slam. Park, who has won two majors this season, ended at five under, tying for eighth place with two other Korean golfers. Taxes are likely to rise in Korea next year. The government says it needs extra revenue to boost the sluggish economy, which is not recovering as fast as officials had hoped. Kim Jeon reports. The government says it has to collect more taxes in the coming years to cover its rising expenses. The Ministry of Strategy and Finance estimates it has to collect at least 313 billion U.S. dollars in tax revenue by the end of next year. It adds this amount will reach an all-time high of 338.4 billion by the end of 2017. The government recently laid out a 327 billion budget proposal for 2016. It contains an increase of 3 percent that's designed to give the economy a much-needed shot in the arm. The ministry says the sluggish local economy is to blame for the sharp rise in the amount of tax revenue needed, despite a set of aggressive stimulus measures it has employed. That included a spending package of roughly $11.5 billion in July. This as Korea's exports, mainly to China, dropped to $39.3 billion last month, the lowest level in six years. At the same time, the amount of household debt has soared, reaching a record high of more than $956 billion in June. In response, the ministry says it will be more cautious when laying out the budget in the future. First, it will lower its growth forecast, which serves as an important guideline for spending increases, from the current 6 percent range to 4.2 percent. It will also make it mandatory for government agencies to adopt a pay-as-you-go system, which will require them to reduce spending in advance for new projects. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Now, Seoul is the sixth most expensive place to visit among 11 major cities in Asia. And this is according to online travel booking site Expedia, which says visitors need to budget for around 280 US dollars per day when they're in the South Korean capital. And that's almost double the amount one would need for a trip to Tokyo. In contrast, the Japanese city of Osaka easily outranks Seoul. Bali at more than $400 per day and Hong Kong also had heftier price tags. The ranking shows Hanoi is the ideal destination for budget travelers as a visitor's daily travel expenses average just over $110 a day. The cost per day takes into account a one-night stay at a five-star hotel, taxi fare, three, meal, three meals and two pints of beer.
Chusak, the Korean harvest holiday is around two weeks away now and consumers and retailers are occupied with the gift packages that are traditionally handed out by employers and families as well. This year, retailers sensitive to the sluggish economy are offering a wide variety of discounted and promotional items. Lotte Mart is slashing 30% off some 780 Chusak gift sets while other major retailers are holding two-for-one events. The Ministry of Environment is seeking to reduce the amount of packaging in oversized holiday gift boxes by passing new regulations that require the core items to fill at least three quarters of the box. Commercialization of 3D printing, smart farms and stem cells in three years. That's the ambitious goal set by Korea's Ministry of Science, ICT and Future Planning and the National Research Council of Science and Technology. Now, it may sound like a tall order, but efforts to make strides in these fields have been ongoing in line with the government's flagship creative economy policy. More and more conglomerates have been collaborating with the science ministry to set up innovation centers that focus on using smart technology in farming. And state-led investment has been expanded to speed up clinical trials and the commercialization of stem cells and genetic drugs. On top of this, the science ministry has been collaborating with the trade ministry to develop a 3D, or rather the 3D printing industry and promote its integration with the Internet of Things, big data and e-commerce. Now, tourists and residents alike came out this past weekend to get a chance to soak in some traditional Korean culture at a festival held in the heart of Seoul. Uh, Lee soo takes us there. A marching folk band, a plate-spinning jester, and a royal couple in their wedding hanbok. This is a royal procession passing through the heart of Seoul. Here at the 28th Insa Traditional Culture Festival, children, tourists, or just about everybody is enjoying a weekend full of Korean traditional culture. Modern culture is good, but traditional culture is in our roots. People need to take more of an interest in it. And that's exactly what this festival is for, giving people the opportunity to enjoy Korea's traditions with their own hands. This tourist sits around a traditional Korean wooden table called sang with his friends and immerses himself in the subtle scent of tea, just like Koreans have done for centuries. It is nice to drink it, especially with the traditional way of the people serving the tea. And after that, you feel so relaxed. Others are making their own wooden folk paintings of tigers and magpies meant to shoo away ghosts. Loving it. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. It's the, uh, uh, well, we're going to take this back home, then we're going to post this home tomorrow. The INSA Traditional Culture Association has been hosting the festival since 1987. Back then, it was just about giving people in Seoul an extra something to do over the weekend. But now, the event has taken on a life of its own. About 300,000 people visit INSA Dome for the festival. It's an event where people can understand the Korean identity. The festival wraps up on Sunday, but the spirit of Korean traditional culture will continue to flourish in Insadong. Lee Soon, Arirang News. Now, on top of a great many traditions, did you know that Korea is one of the breakdance capitals of the world? In fact, eight of the best b-boy teams in the world were in Seoul on Sunday to take part in an international breakdance competition. Our Guan Zhang Ho has the details. Welcome to the R16 World B-Boy Championships. It's held in Korea every year, and it's one of the top b-boy competitions in the world. This is Team Korea, and they are warming up for the big event. They reached this year's world finals by beating all before them in Korea's national eliminations. That's no mean feat. Korea has one of the most competitive breakdown scenes in the world. Over the last 13 years, 18 of 32 major world crew titles have been won by a Korean team. This success has brought them unprecedented support from the government. In fact, R16's main sponsor is the Korea Tourism Organization. We wanted to show the world that Korea has a modern and dynamic youth culture. 
There were national qualifiers in 25 countries. It was a useful opportunity to show a new side of a Korean culture. The Korean b-boy scene has come a long way since the turn of the century, when performers were largely looked down upon by Korean society. When he first started to win international competitions, we would still proudly wave the Korean flag. B-boying has now found its place among Korea's Hallyu content and well regarded among the wider public. Team Korea won the performance section of the competition, but in the main battle event, they were beaten in the semi-final stage by the home nation of b-boying, Team USA. Although Team Korea did not win this year's main R16 title, Korean b-boys can still be proud of their immense achievements over the last decade. And there's always next year. Won Jang Ho, Airang News. Well, that's all we have for now. I'm Mark Broom. Have a great day and a good start to the week. And thank you, as always, for tuning in. Goodbye.